Thanks, sir. Daniel. Thank you, George. <clears throat> so what's changing in the science? What have we learned in the past 10 years for the fire service? Well, we got an understanding that what the fire service was being taught was only part of the story. When you're getting your fire behavior training in that three hours or eight hours or whatever it is that was required when you were coming up through Firefighter One, they were only telling you about one ideal of a fire. You had ignition, growth, fully developed fire and then decay. And that's an ideal fuel controlled fire. So if you have pallets in the burn building, they're gonna burn that way every time. If you have a small fire in a big room, it's gonna burn that way every time because it has enough oxygen to burn that fuel to the best of its ability. But the fires that you go to routine, routinely, whether it's in a residential structure or a commercial structure, in many cases are gonna be ventilation controlled. And by the time you arrive, we're going to go a step further. They may even be vent limited, which means that they started off as a fuel controlled fire when they were in the incipient stage, had plenty of oxygen. As they burned in their combustion products, started to fill the room of origin and the adjacent rooms that were open to the rooms of origin, it consumed the oxygen that was trapped in the building, replaced it with toxic gas, replaced it with unburned fuel gases, an unburned carbon particulate that could also burn again at a later time. And what it needed was to complete that fire triangle, once it got ventilation limited, it needed more oxygen in order to have flaming combustion. Sometimes the windows would auto vent on their own and you'd arrive on the scene and there would be flames coming out of the window. Other times you might on, arrive on the scene and it doesn't look so bad. In many of the NIOSH line of duty death incidents, the survivors would say, we got there, we saw nothing but smoke. And they almost say it as if they were relieved that when we got there, it was just smoke. What did they think? They thought they got there early. They didn't realize the fire would have already flashed over if only it had enough oxygen to do so. So ventilation was made, perhaps in not the most highly coordinated manner that we would think about today. Doors were open to take a quick look and then the officer might come back and talk to the crew. Or the officer may give a direction to say, we've got a house full of smoke, let's do a search while we bring the line. Because they thought they were early. And then conditions rapidly changed. As you can see in the graph there, vertical line, as Derek Alconis indicated in our hot class, the fire service does not like those vertical lines. And so then as the NIOSH reports went through, they kept coming back over and over and over again that it seems that fires are flashing over faster than ever today. Now maybe, or maybe they're waiting for you. The time when they flash over is when they have enough heat and enough fuel and enough oxygen to do so. So we have to remember one key thing, and that is that smoke is fuel. And here's an easy demonstration you can do in any firehouse at any kitchen table. And just so you don't think that the government spent millions of dollars on a high-speed camera, that was done with my cell phone. So you folks have the power in your pocket to do these kinds of things. The fuels are different today. Another easy demonstration you could do in the firehouse. A piece of wood, notice how clean it burns, how slow the flame would travel horizontally along that splinter of wood. You might get some light gray smoke out of it. And then ignite a piece of expanded polystyrene. Our homes are full of this kind of material. Synthetic material made from petroleum products. Where do we get expanded polystyrene? Cut a piece of foam coffee cup and light it. Notice how sooty it is. It's full of unburned fuel. It would like in excess of 21% oxygen in order to burn cleanly. You've all seen the excellent UL comparison that they did in the lab. Well, here's a comparison that we didn't exactly plan. It just sort of happened. We were burning down in Spartanburg. We went to the local thrift store to purchase some furniture. 
Both these pieces of furniture in this case are made out of polyurethane foam. Interestingly enough, the polyurethane foam of the 1980s and the 1990s was heavier and denser than the materials in the furniture that we buy today. It's even the polyurethane foam that we have in our house is changing over time. And as you see, the, the newer the furniture, the faster it seems to burn. Flow paths. This is new to the fire service. It's starting to get in the books. It's starting to get in the, uh, the training manuals and training videos. Uh, various training companies are starting to use the terminology. And we want to make sure we get the terminology correct. So the flow path is basically the geometry of the house. Where are the doors? Where are the windows? Where's the fire? Basically, as you open up ventilation, you're going to be creating inlets and outlets for fresh air and hot gas. Some of those doorways that you'll see here in the, uh, the animation, that doorway is a bi-directional vent. It has inlet air coming in low. The fire acts as a pump and pumps the heated, higher pressure hot gases out of the doorway. But notice that the flow path itself, if you follow the arrows, 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 the blue as it goes through the fire and turns red around, is unidirectional. The flow path is always going to be unidirectional. Just depends on what the vents are doing and how it moves around. We could also have a similar case if the vent was on the other side of the fire and we had wind on the inlet where you might have just blue oxygen coming in one side and all red exhaust going out on the other side changing in the flow path depending on where the pressure is. Another term you'll hear about is neutral plane. Well, neutral plane is an interface at a vent. Could be a window, could be a door. And when we have the fresh air going in low and hot gases coming out high, the neutral plane is that dividing line. If we don't have a neutral plane in a vent, we call that a unidirectional or a one-way vent. Could be full exhaust, could be full inlet, depending on how the pressure is balanced, because in order to get gases to move, we have to have a pressure difference. And high pressure always moves toward the area of low pressure. So here's some diagrams just looking at a flow path, let's say, in a very simple, single, closed room. We have some air low to the floor. This is very early in the fire, an incipient stage. The fire again acts as a pump, and you see that it will start to fill the hot gas layer, and then we'll get some recirculation, and eventually the green arrows will go away as the oxygen is consumed, and it will just be filled with short red stagnant arrows kind of sitting there waiting for somebody to vent the room. Let's say we open the window first. Well, if we open the window, some of the exhaust gases are going to come out the top of the window, and then below the neutral plane we'll have fresh air going in low, and it's going to drop down because it's heavier and denser than the hot gases and be entrained by the pull and get pulled into the flame coming from the fire. What if we open the door instead? Same kind of thing. We're going to have a neutral plane in the door because that's the only vent in that area. Hot gases are going to come out the top, fresh air goes in low. Let's go crazy, let's open the door and the window. Now you notice that since the neutral plane in the door is below the sill of the window, the window itself becomes full exhaust because basically it's in the smoke layer. So the only air inlet is from the, uh, the doorway itself. A door is a much more efficient vent to feed air to a fire typically than a window is. We had a great opportunity in Spartanburg. We've had many, many wonderful opportunities with FDNY, Chicago, uh, Phoenix many years ago. Big, big city fire departments. And then sometimes we get the feeling from folks that, you know, Dan, most fire departments aren't like that. We can't show up with 40 members or 60 members to a fire. We got these two guys on a truck. And later, two other guys may come, or some folks may arrive by their POV, or the neighbors may decide to help and pull hose or whatever, and, you know, can we do this? Can we use the science to help us? And that's sort of what this program with ISFSI was about, looking at the broader uh, array of fire departments in the United States. So here we have a number of buildings that are about 1,000 to 1,400 square feet. And we did a number of different scenarios with them. In this case, we have a garage fire. And when we went through Spartanburg, we kind of looked at 
traditional tactics, and then we looked at, is there a better way of doing it or a different way of doing it in any case? So in this case, we're going to do the traditional interior attack. The officer's gonna do the size up, but after he does the size up, he's gonna do what he's been trained to do, and that is go into the front door, take a line inside, the idea being they don't want to push fire into the house, open up the kitchen door, or the door which is located between the garage and the, uh, and the house, the residential part of the house, and then apply water. So we're gonna have the simulation where we're gonna open the door. The thermal imaging camera view that you see in the lower corner there is at the back of the house looking toward the front of the house. It's a central hall in the house looking toward the front door. The kitchen is just off to the left of that central hallway. There you see the firefighter going to open the door. The door is open now. Notice how there's a circulation that started in the kitchen, which is in the rear of the home, based on just opening that door. And some heat starting, some smoke is starting to move into the, uh, the central hallway. We allowed time for the firefighters to crawl in. We have a pre-deployed monitor that we're simulating a fire attack. Notice that even though the fire is venting out the front of that garage, there's still enough excess pressure to push heat into the hallway of that home over those firefighters' heads. The nozzle's flowing, it's a narrow fog, it's flowing 150 gallons a minute. And some were surprised that the fire went out. Well, we have a box full of fire, it's got an air vent to it. We put 150 gallons per minute of water in it, it's gonna go out. Success, right? People called the fire department, the fire department came, the fire went out. The interesting thing is in that process of putting the fire out, Sean DeCrane this morning talked about codes. So one of the things that the codes require typically is that if you have a uh, single family home with an attached garage, the only rated piece of construction in your home, fire rated piece of construction in your home, it's not gonna be the floor. It's not going to be the ceiling. Typically, it's going to be that wall, and they're going to require a fire door in that wall. So most of the time, the tactic that's currently practiced is you're going to go in and remove the piece of fire protection that's intended to protect the occupants and you to go to start the fire. So let's look at another scenario. We have a similar home. It has an attached garage. In this case, we're going to leave that kitchen door closed. So the bottom views look at the, are looking at a video view and a thermal imaging view of the inside of the kitchen door. So we can start to see some heat leakage coming around the, uh, the sides of that kitchen door a little bit. The officer's doing his size up. And when the officer gets back around to the front of the house, he sees that the only fire involvement is in the garage. He's gonna direct his firefighters to use the reach of their stream, flow water into the garage from the curb. There's a car in that garage. Why don't you want to get on top of a car fire nowadays? Struts, hydraulics, all kinds of things want to shoot out at you. Use the reach of the stream. Notice that when they get the stream high in the space in the hot gas layer that they're most effective. They're giving it a little knock low. They get the, the line up a little bit. Fire's done. 150 gallon a minute straight stream. They flowed for seconds. Then you can move in, get it. Now you can have somebody open the door to the kitchen, uh, go to, through the front door, quickly search the house, walking, having great visibility, not having to worry about any heat. If someone's trapped in there, are they in a better environment than they would have been if you made the attack through the garage door? Would the firefighters in the house be in a better environment? Is there less exposure to the firefighters through this whole evolution? in terms of cancer-causing agents, perhaps, as well as heat stress <clears throat> that could onset a heart attack? Was this a success? So they both work, right? It's just, which one works best for you? Here we have a fire that you see <clears throat> at the time of this video, we're starting nine minutes and 30 seconds after ignition. So the fire's been burning for a while. You've been called, you arrive, what did you see upon arrival at nine minutes and 30 seconds? Light smoke. <clears throat> there's doors open, there's some windows open in the house. Watch how rapidly that condition changes. 
A minute and a half later, we've got some fire showing. You're pulling lines, you're getting hooked to the hydrant. Your officer's doing a size up with the tick. Watch what's going on during this time. We're coming up on three minutes since you first saw the fire. We've also had other comments, and this is why we were doing this experiment. Well, you guys are always putting the fire out when it's only limited to one compartment, or it only has one vent opening. So here again, we're going to have an inch and three-quarter line, 150 gallons a minute, straight stream. Let's see what it can do. Use the reach of the stream. Pretty effective. What do firefighters really want to do every time when they see a house like this? They want to get on that porch, don't they? They want to get on that porch, five, six firefighters, ten firefighters, if you can get them on the porch. They don't even care if the flames are licking their helmet, and then they're going to get water in there. And most of the time, you get a pretty cool charred helmet out of it, I guess, and things are okay. But even in Spartanburg, in a fire department next to Spartanburg, they had an incident about five years ago. They got on the porch, and the porch collapsed. And it trapped three firefighters under the porch. And when that porch is leaning down like this, pinching their hose line, so now they don't have any water, what are they exposed to? They're exposed to that post flashover fire from the living room. I believe it's about a month ago, a similar thing happened. I believe that firefighter died. In the case of the Spartanburg case, the chauffeur got an ax and started whacking through the top of that porch and got the members out. So fortunately, they only sustained injuries. Use the reach of the stream. Flow path. Flow path comes into play when we start talking about pushing fire. So here we have a a incident where if you look at exterior side B, those two windows there, that's the, that's the fire room. And those windows are out and you'll start to see some smoke coming from the windows. That's the only exterior exit. As we look at our, the two, other two views on the bottom there, we have the closed room which is on the AD corner. And uh, we have a visual view in the center and a thermal imaging camera view of that closed room next to it. Up in the upper right hand corner there where you see the thermal imaging camera, again that's the central hall of the house basically leading from the door of the burn room toward the front, toward the front door of the house. So we can see some heat building up in the hallway, just a little bit. The fire's struggling because it only has its exhaust and its air inlet into that, uh, into that room. If you did the size up and saw that and immediately got water in that room, this event is, is done. But we're not going to do that here because we're trying to demonstrate some phenomena for you. So what we're going to do is open that front door. We open that front door. Now we've created another outside vent. We've created another place for the gases to go and another source of oxygen to feed the fire. So now we have a bi-directional vent at the front door as well as a little bit currently a bi-directional vent at the uh, fire room window. What do you see happening in that hallway? Where are the fire gases moving now? They're moving from the fire room toward the front door. The fire's building. As it gets more fresh oxygen, the heat release rate increases. The amount of combustion products increase. The pressure of the gases and the temperature of the gases increase, so the pressure increases. And the push down the hallway gets even more severe. Notice how the colors are changing, the temperature is increasing. Now we flashed over that room in the rear. Notice that now we basically have directional vents out of the fire room windows and all the fresh air is coming down the hall with heavy exhaust going toward the front door. So we close the door to try to shut it down. We shut the oxygen off. What happens? Works pretty good. Now we're going to open the door again. We'll see if we can cycle it back again. Does the fire pick up once again? Absolutely. Because even though we shut the door and slowed it down and made things better and delayed things, what didn't we do? We didn't put any water on the fire. 
So now we're going to put water on the fire through that window, and you're going to watch the hallway, and you tell me if that hallway gets any worse right outside that fire room based on them applying water. Hmm. Anybody see any fireball? What if there was a victim laying in the hall? Did you help him or hurt him? That floor was starting to turn yellow and red. Red's probably bad, right? Now all of a sudden it's ambient conditions. Dan, can I just ask a question here? Sure. <clears throat> Remember I asked that question earlier about fire out the window. Is that good or bad? And again, I never really knew if it was good or bad, but I was told it was good. But remember what happened in that hallway view. That hallway appeared thermally to be fairly tenable prior to what? Well, prior to us opening up the front door, creating a flow path, you could see that more heat moved into that hallway. But when did things really change? When it started coming out the front windows, right? So we were always taught, and we were taught this by well-intentioned members of the fire service, and they were passing down knowledge, and that's how knowledge gets passed along in, in the U.S. fire service quite often. But now we can, we can take our fire ground experience, and we can take the data and the information that they're giving us, and we can really truly understand what it means throughout the structure when we pull up and we see fire coming out the windows. Or if we start our advance and all of a sudden fire starts coming out the windows. And then hopefully that will empower us to make changes on the fire ground where we now understand, if I'm in the rear and I see that happening, I better get on the radio and let everyone know because if there are crews inside, guess what? They could very possibly be in harm's way. And that harm will come upon them so rapidly that there's a great possibility they won't have an opportunity to change their tactics and to remove themselves from that, that area of danger. And out of tribute to Richie Scalfani and the double line of duty death in San Francisco and the, uh, the report that's about to be released, right, Sean, from Toledo, Ohio, we have far too many examples. We have far too many people that we honor. Let's break that error chain. Let's be honest with ourselves. And let's be true to their legacy. Thank you. So here we have another structure. We've got a couple of flow paths here. You can see on the B side, we have fire coming out of the, uh, the fire room in the rear. On the D side, you can see that we have another room that's vented that appears to be communicating with the fire room. They apply a straight stream initially, and then they change it over to a fog line as they get closer and put water into the window. We see they're getting conversion. They're knocking it down. Temperatures throughout the inside of that structure are getting cooler. Success. Let it, some of the smoke clear and you can see. Made a very good knockdown on the fire. Didn't spread the fire to any other rooms. Cooled everything off. That jumped too quick. Let's see. Ah, pardon me, once we start jumping it gets a little... Crazy. Here we go. Here's a video from our friend uh, Brian Ward with ISFSI, and this is a great example of partnerships. So NIST had a number of cameras uh, out there. The South Carolina um, Training Academy had a number of fires out there looking at this fire, and none of our cameras caught this phenomenon just because they were angled just a little bit wrong or didn't weren't quite far enough away from the building. So thank you for uh, Brian for. Uh, providing us with this. This is the house on the other side of the street of the house I just showed you. So in this case, we're going to attack this fire with a wide fog from the outside. Again, not something that's recommended. So we have these two rooms that are communicating. 
There you see the neutral plane in the fire room, and there you see that we have a unidirectional flow from the room next door because the sill height is higher than the air inlet. You'll notice that as it's burning, we have such rich fuel gases coming out of the smaller window that they can't catch fire until they lean out enough, mix with enough oxygen and start to burn. So as the camera pans back, you'll see some flames up above the roof line or the eave line that are actually in the smoke that's coming out of the smaller window. Now we're going to attack it with a fog line. There's your fireball. Why do we have a fireball in that case? Because we we're air entrainment. We blocked the vent where the hot gases were going out, so those, that extra fuel stayed in the room. We entrained air into the space, and we basically didn't get any water into the space. Once they stepped up, got water in the space, things got better. So the following year at Spartanburg, we had an opportunity to do a side-by-side -side demonstration. <clears throat> so in this case, on the second floor, the top two images are showing you the video view and the thermal imaging view of side A of the house, the front of the house. We have two similar sized rooms with similar fuel loads that we ignited at the same time. The lower views show you the entrance from the rear of the house looking up the stairs. Again, a video view and a thermal imaging camera view. The two rooms are connected by a short hallway less than four feet wide and it has wood paneling on it and a wood combustible wood ceiling. That's why I have that burning in there. So on the one side, we introduce a straight stream, 150 gallons a minute, bouncing it off the ceiling. With the straight stream, we're maximizing the water getting in the space. We're minimizing the air being entrained. And most importantly, we're leaving that lower pressure vent open to allow combustion products and any steam that might be generated out. Now we're going to do a bad thing. Wrong tactic, wrong tool. Fog nozzle gets you the push down the stairs. So for those that have said, hey, I've had fire pushed on me, possibly you had. Is there a way you can do it without pushing fire or creating a high pressure to move those hot gases that are ready to ignite once they mix with oxygen effectively are pushing fire? Yes. Use the straight stream. Don't whip it around to cover the window and life will be good. Again, even with the fog, once they stepped up and got water in the window, Things were in pretty good shape. Steve?